your hosts have earned a reputation as fierce and effective advocates inside and outside of the courtroom. Both partners are experienced trial attorneys who have been board certified in family law by the Texas Board of Legal Specialization. Thanks for tuning in to the For Better or Worse or Divorce podcast, where we provide you tips and insight on how to navigate divorce and child custody situations. I'm Brian Walters, and today Dr. Daphne Ainsley from Ainsley Consulting is here with me. Daphne's a licensed psychologist in Austin who conducts forensic evaluations and consultations along with clinical and diagnostic assessments and psychotherapy. She also does child custody evaluations and other court-related work. I work with Daphne on several cases, and I thought uh, she'd be a perfect guest to have on to discuss uh, child custody evaluations in general. So thanks for joining us today, Daphne. Well, thank you for having me, Mr. Walter. Is happy to be here, Brian. You bet. Well, give us a little history of you know how how you got here, and don't just give us the boring academic stuff. You know, where did you grow up? You know, what what was your you know childhood like? What did you? How did you decide to get into? where you are. And uh, so tell us a little, a little bit about yourself. Yeah. So I come from a very small coastal town in Texas. Which one out of curiosity? Cause that's where my, my family's from that area too. Just curious. Oh, interesting. So I'm from Rockport, Texas. My mom grew up and went to Aransas Pass High School. My dad in Corpus. Um, I have an aunt and uncle that live in Rockport. My parents live, you know, three miles from Rockport right now. They still, they live in Aransas. So, small world. It's a small, good world, um, and that's even a smaller world down there. I mean, I couldn't wait to get out of there, but these days I love going back. It's really fun just to be very simple on the coast and enjoy some fishing and great seafood. And my parents' families, my dad's family in particular, has been there for generations. Um, so it's it's you know the salt is part of my uh, my history here. Um, you know, how did I get into psychology? I had this really great high school teacher and he was a psychologist and he taught my first ever class in psychology. And at that point, I was just pretty captivated by it. I really liked how this is a field where we're always learning and there is so much to be explored and understood. And it, it's really something to kind of meet people. And then there is so much behind all of us and and so your opening question i'm so impressed by you know like really let's really talk about yourself and 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 it's funny that i hesitated but i think that's what we all do in some form uh because it's it's um not easy to be um open all the time um so i i really liked psychology and the history of it and and how it's a, a constantly evolving field. Um, but in order to do the work that I do today in my practice, or I'd say the majority of the work that I do today, which is evaluation, I had to have a history of assessment experience and training. So I began that when I was um, getting my doctorate education and I just sought it out. And initially I was working uh, with psychologists uh, in San Antonio, which is where I completed my doctorate. And I just found it really kind of another level of gaining data about someone and then trying to interpret that and understand it and then utilize that information against other other information that's collected. So initially I was doing academic assessments and, and clinical assessments and intellectual assessments. And I did a lot of work with adults. Um, then I also did some training, what would be like the old Brown schools now. So um, got a lot of training with kids, um, which was unique and, and special. Um, I also did my first forensic work was actually at the San Antonio State Hospital when I did some competency work. And there was a judge there that came to the state hospital weekly. And in, in part, it was my job as a as a practicum student, but to kind of work with the individuals on the unit and and give an opinion about and recommendation about competency. So it was there that I thought this is really something different. This is something unique. It, it's all important. I think the work that we all do, um, but I thought this is a, a different way of kind of capturing what's what's happening for someone. Um, so that's kind of where I 
I had my first forensic interest. And then with the assessment experience, I thought this is something that I can do and, and grow and, and learn more about. Yeah, that makes sense. I, I've uh, found over the years that my, <laughs> I don't, I have an undergraduate degree in, um, in business, which has been helpful running a business, but I, I kind of wish I had had a more, I, I think I had to take one psychology and one sociology classes, you know, part of my undergrad, but I wish I'd had a lot more. And I found those skills are more valuable to me. And I've kind of had to learn them the hard way, I think, in just dealing with clients and dealing with other lawyers and other professionals and judges, just that psychology stuff. Um, I, I would say someone who has an undergraduate degree in um, psychology would probably be a good start if you're going to be a family lawyer. Um, uh, maybe an MBA then on top of it, if you're going to run your own firm, but that's, that's the skills I wish I'd had more of, especially earlier, earlier in my career. So yeah, it's, it's interesting. So let's talk about child custody evaluations. Um, so in, in child, you know, custody cases, and that could be people that are married or they never married and had a kid, or they are going back to court to modify something that was done earlier. Um, I'll say just as a lawyer, there, there used to not be anything real specific about that. And they've now added a, a statute in the family code that allows for these. And it's got very specific, uh, requirements about what, what is to be looked at, what the qualifications are for, for folks. Um, but, and so what happens is, is that a court will decide there needs to be one, um, often by the request of both parties, but sometimes by one party or sometimes a judge just decides to do it on their own. And um, and the judge will say, you know, I'd, I'd like to have one of these done to help me or, or our jury decide how we're going to deal with this. So um, can you talk a little bit about the child custody evaluations and, and how they work? What are, what are they trying to do? Um, and comparing and contrasting those maybe a little bit with Psycho psychological evaluations, psychiatric evaluations, how, they, how they're similar, how they're different? So what usually happens on my side of it is, is the court or, and attorneys will figure, figure out what's needed. And um, custody evaluators generally enter the picture once it's ordered. Um, so it's, it's very important to, for your, your clients, um, people, per, participants in these uh, evaluations to understand what that is. And <clears throat> typically a, a custody evaluation follows the statute or, or it should. Um, so it's really important to just uh, for custody evaluators to, to know what's in that statute, to review it and to check for updates. So a perfect example is our legislative session just, well, the regular session just ended. And so it's a good time to go back and revisit what changes might be taking place um, in September. So that's something that I've got on my calendar to, to keep an update about. Um, yeah, yeah, because there, there will be changes um, typically or updates. And so uh, I guess that's in part, you know, as, as what I was saying earlier, this is an evolving field. We're always trying to do better. And I think that that's really um, important to, to review. Um, you asked about child custody evaluations specifically in, in comparison to those that are forensic or psychological evaluations, um, kind of more generally. A custody evaluation, I really think about it as a, as a very deep dive into the uh, life of a family or a family system. And as you said, that could be a, a divorcing couple that was, that was married, and it could be, you know, people who were never married before and are trying to decide and agree or come to a decision about how, what's best for our child or children in terms of how much time we the, each of them gets with us and and how is that decided who will um be the ultimate decider of that which is typically a judge or a jury right um <clears throat> In order to get to that, those recommendations, a, a custody evaluator um, will make some recommendations. I think that's the ultimate goal. I think that's what um, the the endeavor is: is to gather data, um, synthesize it, interpret it, and give that those conclusions and recommendations to the court. Um, 
to gather the data that that takes several process steps and it's a, it's a long process and i think that's one thing i i really want to underscore um that it really does take a lot of time i think people would be surprised at how long it takes but it is a process that you typically want it done really well you want it to be very thorough and you want to have some solid conclusions and recommendations at the end of the process um which means time it also means i'll just put it out there you know these are these typically because of the time that it takes to complete them it's going to cost a chunk of money and so that's something i think people should be aware of and, and really think about um when moving through this process um what what it will take of them um i like and to tell people that i evaluate and it's partly in my informed consent you know we're going to be looking pretty deeply into your life. We're going to want a life history. We want to interview you um, typically for, for several hours over, over a period of time. Um, custody evaluations will gather data from collateral informants. So that could be teachers, nannies, um, family members, people who might be um, able to speak to questions about parenting. Um, or questions about history or questions about co-parenting for that matter. Also important is a review of records. So if there's um, any records that need to be uh, reviewed pertaining to the parents, pertaining to the children in, in, the, the, in the family. Um, I'm a psychologist and I'll, I'll do some psychological assessment. I don't know, I, I, you know, it's not required by the statute but it is an option of, of the statute. So I think that's something to, to remember that there may be psychological assessment taking place in a custody evaluation. Um, I would say, and Brian, maybe you can tell me more about this, but I say typically it does happen. Um, uh, there's a component of that. And if the custody evaluator doesn't do it, then someone else, a psychologist would typically. Um, so, What's also unique to custody evaluations are home visits. So you'll have someone come into each home and observe the parent and the child or children. And I think that's really important um, to have an observation period of time. Typically, I also have people bring a child or children to my office, depending on the circumstance. Um, and, and each family is unique. So um, they, these are not cookie cutter evaluations, but you really have to consider the um the structure of the family and what's possible typically a report should explain all of this what what's happening what the limitations might be and uh based on all of the data collected these are the conclusions and recommendations yeah that makes sense and um, another question is how do we how do we figure out which child custody evaluator we're going to use and um, it's interesting. I, I found, um, you know, you're, I mean, I work in big cities, Dallas, Houston, you know, Austin, San Antonio, usually, and uh, there are a surprisingly small number of folks that, that we have to choose from. Um, I think there's a couple reasons for that. I've found that most people, mental health providers <laughs> including, <laughs> included, uh, don't like to be in court and don't like to be, you know, cross-examined and attacked and all that other stuff, which is you know, what's going to happen to a child custody evaluator in a case if someone's, someone, maybe both, are not going to like some or all of the conclusions. And uh, so, and then, of course, it does, there are some pretty high requirements. So um, generally, I mean, to answer that question, I, I found that most of the time, the courts uh, and the, well, the attorneys usually know who those folks are, and you will usually be able to agree on, hey, let's use this person you know, they, they have done good jobs for me in the past, or they're fair, they're open, you know, whatever. Um, the, the judges have a list of folks as well, although they're often the same list. So um, it's usually, that's usually not that difficult of a thing to do. And um, I know that clients want to know, well, you know, what it, will this one help me or that one help me and, you know, be more favorable to me. I, I think generally that's, uh, that's not the way the courts or attorneys think about it. We're trying to find somebody who's going to do a good, thorough job. Um, so has that been your observation of it as well? I really would agree with that because um, a custody evaluator is ordered by the court. So the client of the custody evaluator is the court. And um, 
there are two sides in the case, however. And so typically it may, it might feel to some that there is um, a tendency to, to really support one side or the other. And to the degree that you can, you know, we can stay away from that. I think that's, that's best because we really do want conclusions and recommendations that are really in the best interest of the child or children and overall of the family. Um, and, it, you know, it, it's not a, a typical for there to be some recommendations that may be inconsistent with the way someone uh, in the family system thinks about him or herself or their family system. I agree. So there's a lot of things that a child custody evaluation can can evaluate and ultimately make recommendations about. And just, just to be clear for everybody, it's a recommendation, right? It's ultimately the judge or the jury who makes a decision if the parents can't decide on what they're going to do. So if a child custody evaluator you know, evaluates it and recommends you know, dad have custody, the judge might disagree and, and go the other way, just, just to be clear about that. It's not, it doesn't have the force of law, although they're, they're, I think, very important to a judge and, um, and the judges pay very close attention to them and, and very frequently follow or very closely follow what, what's recommended. Um, so I've found that they, the cases kind of fall into two categories um, one is just a custody case where you've got two parents who probably have pretty good claims to be the primary custodial parent. Maybe they're both, you know, very active parents. They both have, uh, you know, are good functioning people without problems. And it's a close call and uh, the court wants somebody to kind of make a recommendation which way to lean. Um, the second category I found is kind of typically is where there's a problem and we're tar with one of the parents or maybe both, but usually one parent and we're dealing with what kind of controls, restrictions, parameters are we going to put on their contact with the children to protect the, the children from, you know, either an addiction issue or a mental health problem. Um, does it, I mean, there's always gradations. Sometimes both are at issue, but um, is, has that been your, your, fi your finding or your experience that those are the two main categories or do you find there's, there's others as well? I think I would agree with you that those are, I think that's a good summary of the two main categories. You know, as, as you and I both know, I mean, all families are different. So uh, I see new families all the time, you know, with things that I never would have imagined before. Um, but I think typically these are situations just as you described. I would, I would agree with that. Yeah. And I mean, you know, for better or worse, our system in Texas requires, if you go to trial, basically requires the court to pick a primary parent. That word is never actually in the, in a court order, but that's essentially what it is. And then from there, everything kind of flows off of it. The non-primary parent gets typically a standard possession order. It typically has to pay child support on a very, very firm, clear calculation, et cetera. So everything kind of tips off of that primary custodial choice. Um, I'm not sure that'll be the law 10 years from now, but that's what it is now. Um, and so that's why that first category is important is who is going to be primary because so many other things flow from that. And then of course, the second one is the, um, you know, if we have a problem, we, how are we going to address it? Let's say you've got an alcohol problem with one of the parents. Well, you know, the evaluation, I think, typically might include an evaluation of that, of that problem. How severe is it? How long has it been going on? How far along are they in the process of controlling it? What is the likelihood of, of falling back into using? Uh, if they did fall back into using, how severe of a problem would that be? Um, so that, that's, again, my, typically what I've what I've found. So, um, so lastly, let's talk a little bit about what a parent who's going to go through an evaluation um, is going to experience and, and what they should do. I'll talk about it first from someone as an attorney representing folks, and then you can kind of talk about it from, from your perspective. I mean, I, I think, first of all, they, they should talk to their lawyer carefully and, and openly. And 
Um, and a lawyer should be honest with them. You know, like, hey, you know, you've got an issue here. You have a history, the example I just used, you've got a history of drinking excessively. So that's going to come up and it's not going to help you to deny it ever happened or say you don't have a problem or just blame, blame it on something else. You know, just be open and honest and, and talk about it. And then I need to talk to them about the process. And I think you're exactly right. This process can take a long time. It can be very expensive and they need to be prepared for that. They're not going to just walk in, meet with you for 10 minutes uh, and, say, and convince you they're totally great and should be able to do whatever they want to. It doesn't, it doesn't work like that. So they need to be self-aware and, um, and patient, I think. Um, so that, that's typically the advice that, that I would give them. Um, what, are, what, do you, what helps you to get through the process uh, with them effectively? Um, I think you touched on it a bit about uh, about things, but uh, what what when folks are most helpful to you to get to to be able to do your job effectively, what are some characteristics of those type of people? That's a great question. Um, I like to start with, if I may, just take one step back and 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 just say, you know, at the outset is having a good order that really says. Doctor, so doctor, forensic evaluator, custody evaluator, we really want you to answer these questions to the degree that you can, right? Um, I won't, you know, pretend that anybody may have all the answers. However, we can, we will, we'll try to get really close to answering those things. So to your, uh, if we continue on the example of excessive alcohol use, a question about alcohol use should probably be in that order if you want that evaluator to look at that. Um, so I find having the questions listed within the body of the order is, is really important. That also tells your client, you know, this evaluator will be looking at these questions. So be prepared to speak to them. Um, I like to tell anybody, any party who walks through my door, you know, ask questions as you have them. I will do my best to answer them to the degree that I can during this process. If not, you have hired an attorney, please lean on him or her to answer questions that you have along this process because we want you to be informed. And, and that's partly my role as well is to secure that informed consent. Um, most people, like people who walk into my office that I do these for are ordered to participate. Um, so if they choose not to, then that's a legal issue uh, for them, not for me, because anybody who comes in I've got a form that says that these are the expectations. You know, we want you to show up. I, I need you to respond to me. Um, this is not an easy process. You're you're going to be under, you know, uh, some might might call it the microscope for a period of time. You know, yeah. Do your best to be honest, and and that may be challenging, um, but uh, typically a Psychological assessments will will be able to inform us if there's um, dishonesty um, that may arise. Um, also, we're going to be looking at these elements of your life, and and um, I think it's it's important just to be honest and open um, and cooperative with the process. Um, typically people who are participating in this may be in therapy. And I think that's a, a decision that that individual has to make um, because it can be helpful um, to, while in this process. So something to think about for your clients. Um, let's see. Other things that I might tell people is, is, you know, try to come at this with the understanding that I really believe it, that, most of us who work in this area, it's difficult. Uh, it's very important and we're all doing our best to get to recommendations. And I, and I think judges are get, doing their best to make recommendations and orders that are in the best interest of the children. Yeah, I agree. And, um, and that's difficult, right? I mean, you know, folks are in, a, in, a, in an unpleasant divorce and, you know, whatever, whatever the complaint is, again, we'll use the alcohol example. If that's just been a probably a thorn in their relationship and marriage for years. And the last thing they want to do is hear more about it. And the last thing they want to do is acknowledge that maybe their spouse had a point or, you know, maybe 
it's not black and white and um but i don't i don't think that helps anybody i mean because we're dealing with kids right and so we're trying to put aside our our needs and wants as adults and and focus on the kids but it it often <laughs> it often isn't isn't that easy um lastly we talked a lot about going in front of a judge and the judge is ultimately going to decide things but my experience has been I, I don't know what the percentages are but it's a pretty high percentage is that the child custody evaluation often helps us to settle a case that would otherwise be impossible to settle. Um, the classic one is the custody case. It's a close custody case. And, um, you know, we go to, you know, if we just went to mediation before trial, both sides would be able to say legitimately in mediation, look, I think I have a 50-50 chance at it. It's worth it for me to try it. Um, I'm, I don't want to waste money, but it, my kids are more important than money. And then they go try the case where if we have a child custody evaluation, it's come down, you know, clearly it's well done. It's clearly on, let's say it's on mom's side. Um, it's going to be real hard for dad to be in the mediation room and, and, you know, kind of pound the table and insist on a trial because that's going to be a, that's going to tip it from being a 50, 50 case to a case that favors mom. And so a lot of times that'll bring a settlement to the case, which I, I think is, almost always the best choice for for parents who are in a conflict with each other not not always but but most of the time and likewise if there's a significant behavioral issue again let's use the alcohol example you know and the, and the child custody evaluation concludes yeah there is a dad's got a problem with it and he's addressing it but he's in the early stages of addressing it and we're not ready to it's not going to be fair to these kids to just completely ignore it right we need some some controls, some monitoring in place for a certain period of time, and then hopefully there's no problems after that. And and that'll that'll often get the case settled because dad's going to have to deal with that and know that if he goes into court, he, the judge is probably going to see it the same way and is probably going to impose those restrictions on him. So, I, I think it's generally been helpful. Um, so, uh, is that is that your observation? Although there's not a hundred percent success rate, obviously. I wouldn't go to court. That's right. Yeah, but I, I would agree with you. My experience is that after I conduct these, again, I don't have a percentage either. It would be interesting to get that that number. However, most of the time I send these to the attorneys and there's mediation that happens and uh, parents can figure it out. And it could be like, we've decided on this schedule for our kids and our family and this is the way it will be. Or just like you said, you know, we're going to step this up over time and everybody's going to have a chance to do better. And in your example, if, if dad's the one with the alcohol problem, mom's going to have to just, you know, let him go through this process of recovery or whatever that might look like for this family and um, be supportive of of the process. And so I think it gives everybody some time to adjust. And what I found also is typically after these situations take place, a custody evaluation is done, people can exhale and, and kind of lean into what is going to be their new normal for their family. And I think when parents can do that, kids ultimately benefit from it. Right, which is a good way to end the podcast probably, which is that's the whole purpose of this, was to protect the children and put them in the best possible place you know, basically to make as good of a situation as we can out of a bad one, which is, you know, these two parents are divorcing or having a custody battle. Um, okay, well, that's all we have for today. Um, if you like what you've heard today, do us a favor and leave a review. We appreciate all your feedback, especially when it helps better the podcast. If you're interested in reaching out to Daphne directly, we'll have her contact info in the episode notes. Can't thank you enough, Daphne, for joining us today. Uh, as always, if you have any follow-up questions on this episode or would like to talk to one of us directly about your family law situation, reach out to us at uh, podcast at waltersgilbreth.com or just contact us through our website, waltersgilbreth.com. I'm Brian Walters, and thank you for listening. For information about the topics covered in today's episode and more, you can visit our website at waltersgilbreth.com. Thanks for tuning in to today's episode of For Better, Worse, or Divorce, where we post new episodes every first and third Wednesday. Do you have a topic you want discussed or a question for our hosts? Email us at podcast at waltersgilbreth.com. Thanks for listening. Until next time.